Hi, hi, Julian. Hey, how are you? Yeah, pa Patrick here. So yeah, thanks to, to help you to as our as our speakers. So uh, Julian is um, the founder and also co CEO of the Pine Technologies. So uh, his topic is talking about the future of financial institutions and the integration of their value chain using API platforms. So uh, yeah, I can see you try to share the screen. Yeah, it's good. So you click it to full screen. Yeah, it is good. So All right. um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I will pass the stage to you. Thank you. Perfect. So thank you very much for taking the time today to listen to our speech here. Um, my name is Julian Schillinger. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Privé Technologies. We are a B2B wealth tech company servicing financial institutions. Today, I want to talk about how APIs enable the future of banking. But before we go to financial institutions, let's have a quick look at traditional technology companies. One of the biggest, Apple. And how did Apple get to where they are? They basically managed to provide the most seamless, the most best user experience to their clients. And how did they do that? They did everything in-house. They built their own hardware, they put their own software on top, and they make sure everything seamlessly works with each other. But then, when they launched the iPhone, they realized they could not simply provide all the possible apps themselves. And that's when they opened up the app ecosystem of the iPhone for third party developers. As a result, they created a platform. A platform is a technological entity which allows other ecosystem or platform players to join and provide the services on that platform. Financial institutions are still at the previous stage in most cases. So I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm saying all services they provide to clients are produced and sourced internally. So they're basically like a pipe or the whole value chain sits inside the entity. But that is changing. Later we will talk about why it's changing, but let's quickly look into how it's changing. Basically, financial institutions increasingly themselves turn themselves into platforms. What that means is they work with third party ecosystem and platform players, other financial institutions to integrate and provide these third party services in the most seamless possible way to their clients. And the way they do that is via APIs. That's how they integrate these third party services. So now this is the first model. If you're a financial institution, and you have a lot of clients, you want to engage in this model where you become the platform. And here's our case study. So Deutsche Bank, for example, recently integrated with a company called TraxPay. They do factoring and cash flow planning for the corporate clients. But rather than to build their own um, systems or rather than to acquire them, um, they basically integrated them via APIs in a seamless way to offer their clients a better um, user experience. Let's look at the next model. The next model is for financial institutions, which are niche players, which have a specific capability, which is not that easy to acquire. So let's say you can do credit scoring in real time with a much higher accuracy than large banks can do today. Then in these cases, you want to use APIs to become part of a platform, to become part of a platform of somebody who already has a lot of clients. Let's look into a um, case study. So Solaris Bank, uh, it's a bank in Germany, and basically they offer banking as a service. They offer all the underpinning banking services via APIs. So if you want to set up a financial institution, you do not need to reinvent the wheel and you can consume their services. So this is lending, payments, KYCs, and so on. Now, there is a third model as well. And now things start getting interesting. Model one and model two were all about financial institutions partnering with other financial institutions. But what's changing now is that non-financial players enter the stage and they say, look, we've got a lot of clients, we've got a lot of users, we want to bring in all these other financial services to give them the best experience. One example is 
what we've done together with Samsung Bixby. So Bixby is sort of that Google um, Assistant or Siri of Samsung. And basically what Samsung wanted to do, they wanted to bring good financial um, services and sort of the good financial computation engine to all of the Samsung phone users and use that as a conduit to connect to financial institutions. So I can quickly show you that. So you can see here, if I'm in my phone, without the need to install a specific app, so that's sort of pre-installed, already built in, I can basically get the phone to analyze my portfolio, improving my financial well-being. But I can also have a conversation with my phone, which is built in. So I can say, hi, Bixby. And basically, then the phone responds, how can I help you manage your wealth? And let's say I say, help me become a millionaire, right? So now what the phone does is say, let me help to analyze your existing portfolios. And it tells me I will be a millionaire in 12 years. And maybe I'm unhappy. I say, hey, can we make it 10 years? Uh, basically, the preview engine in the back via APIs crunches the numbers again and seamlessly brings it in the phone interface without the need to install an extra app. And basically, it's now recommending a couple of portfolios for me and products I can buy, and then also integrates in the end with the financial institution to do the handover to the financial institution for fulfillment. Another case study for Model 3 is Grab. If you know Grab, Grab is sort of the Uber of um, um, Uber of Southeast Asia, so it's a ride-sharing app. And basically what it does, it's allowed users to top up a balance as a result, creating a wallet, which they can use that balance to pay the drivers. And Grab spent a lot of money in marketing and subsidized the rights to acquire all these users. So now you have a large user audience, which all have cash loaded up to the app. The next natural thing is you allow these clients to do payments at merchants. Obviously, if people need money and they don't have enough money, maybe they're interested in lending and probably they want insurance as well. So all the way that recently Grab bought a company called Bento to provide all the wealth management services to all their clients. So you can see how a transportation company basically uses embedded fintech to provide these financial services to their user base. And all this is happening because of APIs. Now, many people ask me and say, hey, Julian, this sounds so obvious. Somebody must have had this idea before. And somebody had. Um, it just didn't go that well. That's sort of the spoiler alert. So Allianz in 2001, Allianz is a big insurance company. And in 2001, they were sitting in the boardroom and they were like, huh, we have all these advisors, but they're only selling insurance. Could we get these advisors to sell more products, all the banking products, credit cards, loans, mortgages, everything. Wouldn't that be great because we're already paying for these advisors. If they sell more products, we get more wallet share from our clients. So Allian said, that's a great idea. And they called this Alfinanz, it's a German word for all financial products under one roof. And they went out and bought Dresdner Bank for 20 billion US dollars. And they tried to integrate all these banking services into their insurance sales force. And as a result, it was a complete failure. And why was it? Information had to be entered multiple times. The user journeys didn't integrate. Partners of paper, partners of a laptop. So the whole thing just didn't work out. And what do salespeople do if they get confused? They just go back and sell what they know best, which was insurance. So they had to lay off 7,000 people in 2006, 2008. They sold a Dresdner to Commerce Bank for only $6.5 billion. So they lost over $10 billion, not even counting the money they invested along the way. To build a platform. So now, obviously, what has changed? I think APIs are much better understood, um, at least on the transport layer. Um, it's much more standardized. We have REST, Swagger, GraphQL. Consumers are more digital. So they have a higher attraction level for integrated digital services. And at the same time, they're also installing less apps. So in 2019, 65% of the users did not download any new apps. 
So that obviously means rather than publishing your own app, um, every financial institution needs to more think about how they can partner with other ecosystem players, financial and non-financial, to offer their services through that. And for that, APIs is a key enabler. Adoption of the cloud is helpful. And also what happened is that the regulators came in. So I remember in the 90s when I had a mobile phone contract and I wanted to switch from one carrier to the other network carrier, I had to change my phone number. What happened, the regulator came in and said, no, 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 you guys can't do that. The phone number is owned by the mobile phone customer. It's not owned by the carrier. And something very similar is happening in, um, in the open API space. So basically the financial regulators come in and say, the client data, what you know about the client is not owned by the financial institution. It is owned by And as a result, you need to provide open APIs to open up that data to everyone else. So that's now sort of the push factor, the regulatory push, which pushes large incumbents to open up their APIs and their data and make it a more level playing field. Now, let's look at the pull. There's also um, a big risk here. If you look at this chart, this shows you all these little B2C fintech companies, little to medium size, some of them a bit larger, which are out there and trying to kill the bank. They are trying to kill the insurance company. They are trying together to provide all the services traditionally a financial institution would have provided. Now, if you're a financial institution, you must be wondering if these guys get on a platform together or if all these guys partner with the Grabs and Ubers of the world, you're in trouble. So rather than somebody else shooting you in the head, you rather shoot yourself in the leg and you'll be part and an adopter of the open API and the platform ecosystem. And then that's sort of these catalysts which are happening, which make all this happening now. So now it's possible and there's enough incentive to do it. Now, I've been talking about the, the, the sky is blue and the grass is green. That's unfortunately not always the case. There's a number of still hurdles and issues which everyone is facing. The one is there's a lack of standardization. We spoke about REST, we spoke about GraphQL, but that is only standardizing how data is being transported. It does not standardize, however, how the data is in that the so-called payload is structured. So now there are companies like us or TrueLayer who try to bring these aggregation layers to that. The other attempt is obviously to standard the API patterns. So like the banking industry architecture network, they are trying to come up with standards, how data should be structured, how the bank architecture should be built. Um, so that can also help in that respect. The other problem is a discovery problem. If I'm looking for an API which solves a specific problem for my institution, or if I want to integrate that, right now, basically, I have to go to Google. But now there are a number of so-called API marketplaces coming up, and they basically allow discovery of these services, for example, API X. Another issue is that many financial institutions have historically not invested much in the API channel. It's getting much better now. Um, but as of a couple of years ago, it was not normal for a financial institution to even have an API channel. So basically, API calls could not go in and out of the organization. They could only happen in the organization. A lot of investments are being made and have been made to solve this. And obviously, security and compliance is always a big issue um, we need to consider. Now, in the security and compliance, we basically look at three different areas to enable open banking, open APIs. The security itself, how do we secure systems and how do we secure the information exchange between systems? The other part is privacy. How do I make sure I respect the privacy rights? You know, in Europe with GDPR, this is becoming a very hot topic, but also in the rest of the world. The third, but not last point, is consent. Consent means that if I'm allowing institution B to access data from institution A, I need to be able to let institution A know that I'm okay for institution B to access data about me. Now, that's a whole area in itself, but it's a very important area because it also forges trust. And trust, as we all know, is always the biggest impediment 
for any new technology or business model adoption. Now, what do financial institutions need to benefit? First of all, they need to enable API channels and the architecture unless they've already done so. There are a couple of things as API gateways, which can control excessive use of the APIs, version control, and these kind of things. And they need to set up API management frameworks to ensure that APIs are properly documented. Um, and uh, as a result, um, you can also manage the versions and you can do routing and a number of other things. But more important than the technological side is they need to change the way the organization thinks. And the golden rule, if, if a product capability or service capability is not exposed as an API, it does not exist. Now, if you start to think that way, everything, every capability, everything you do becomes an API first consideration. And how it looks in the UI and how it shows up to the client becomes a secondary part. And that builds sort of this buffer between what's the outcome, what will the user see, and what's the actual capability layer. And that's a thought model, that's a mindset, which need to be trained, which need to be fostered. So Amazon did that with the famous Jeff Bezos manifesto. He said in 2002, all services need to be externalizable. Whatever you build, you need to think about it. It will be used by an external party first. And he was quite smart and he was very successful with this. This actually led to the creation of Amazon Web Services, the biggest cloud provider today. So this manifesto can be a way for financial institution to start changing that thought model and that mindset. Now, that gives you a couple of advantages. It becomes reusable, the services you do do. You can sell API as a product or banking as a service to other system players. It's easier to forge partnerships with fintechs, with um, non-fintechs, any, anyone out there in the system. And indirectly, it also creates more innovation because it changes the thought pattern and how things are being thought about. Just two minutes about the company, about Priva Technologies, my company. Um, we ranked the 26 fastest growing company by, uh, by Financial Times in Asia Pacific in 2020. Um, that's across all categories, not limited to FinTech. We have six offices worldwide in Europe and in Asia, and we provide a number of different solutions, um, including providing them via APIs. That's digital engagement. It's like what content and news can you send to your clients to get them interested? The second part is digital advice, which is how do you understand your client? How you can build a wealth plan? How do you can construct a portfolio? How can you make a portfolio proposal? And then digital portfolio management, which sort of takes that advice and makes it happen. That's rebalancing, order generation, order management, portfolio monitoring, portfolio reporting. And then digital intelligence, that's sort of mining all the data from financial institutions about the client and trying to understand how to think about risk, how to think about which behavioral traits they have. And then there's the platform, which sort of helps to normalize much data in the industry. So normalizing market data on one API level, normalizing clients holding positions, i.e. custodial data on one API level taking different asset managers, model portfolios, and bring them on one API level, and also a quant library to do quantitative scenario analysis, how portfolio would have performed, for example, during SARS. All these are sort of building blocks, and they can be easily integrated into existing IT landscapes via APIs, or they immediately click and work with each other, also via APIs. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please ask them now or send me an email. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Julian. So um, maybe I want four questions. So uh, you do mention about the, the consensus management and also uh, maybe you can turn off your, your screen, uh, the screen sharing first and then, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can turn, turn, uh, uh, turn off the screen sharing. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Just uh, go to the hop in. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, okay. you mentioned a bit uh, on the uh, securities uh, is uh, uh, the the core of the open banking, also the consent management, and you do also have office in different region. 
So what do you think of、um, the differences or similarity when talking about doing、uh, open API, open banking in Hong Kong? We all know that there are still、um, the Hong Kong open banking is still evolving. But、uh, what what is your your thoughts about the similarity or differences? Talking about the the consent management, etc. Yeah. So so what what we see in the market is that European initiatives sort of took a lead with PSD two. But that's also reasonably well defined. But saying that, if you read recent reports,、um, whenever the regulator comes in and forces people to enable things, it may not always build like this with、um, the best quality at heart. So it's a little bit tacked on top, and you can see that in the data quality.、Um, so you can see it's sort of reasonably well for payments, but only with PSD three it will come for wealth management to a proper extent. And、um, the the whole consent mechanisms and these kind of things are well defined there. In other regions of the world, there's still a lot more ambiguity around、um, these kind of things and how they should work exactly. And as a result, I think we also see a lower adoption in other regions、mm-hmm. of the world. Yeah, got that, got that. So, yep. Thanks for your time. So,、uh, we really happy to get you here to share about、uh, your insights. So,、uh, 